Economic Club of Minnesota's mission is to provide a world-class nonpartisan forum for national and international leaders in business and public policy to discuss ideas that affect how Minnesota can better compete in the global economy. The Economic Club of Minnesota, engaging the world, strengthening Minnesota. Delighted to accept your invitation. I'm honored and humbled by the size of this crowd. I'm very grateful you're all here. Um, and uh, I just want to thank the club, uh, first of all, for putting me up here at the Radisson. Uh, it's a beautiful hotel. And uh, for doing so much investigative spade work about who I am. Uh, you must have talked to Tim uh, because, you know, he knows a lot about me. He knows a little quirky part of my personality. I have this kind of phobia about carbon monoxide. So you must have taken that information. And then you went to this great, clever extent to get USA Today to publish this fake front page today, because the headline reads, Hotel Guests Face Carbon Monoxide Risk. <laughs> Eight guests die, 170 treated for CO fumes since 2010. Wait a minute, that's not a fake USA Today front page? That's actually real? Wow, you, okay, all right. Um, I noticed also on your program, uh, you have Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke. Um, I have kind of a problem with Ben Bernanke. It has nothing to do with economics. It has nothing to do with the political winds that blow through Washington that sometimes buffet the Federal Reserve. <clears throat> no, I have a, a bone to pick with the Fed chairman because he's embarrassed me. About seven months ago, I wrote a column for National Journal in which I talked about what I called, and I thought it was somewhat clever, wordsmithy of me, uh, the lame duck session from hell, in which I tabulated and talked to economists about the cumulative effect of all sorts of issues that were coming to fore that I knew Congress and the president were not going to confront before the election, but would they come due by December 31st at the end of this year. And it's all the issues you're now familiar with. The expiring Bush tax cuts, the payroll tax cut of 2% from the president, unemployment insurance, other things for Medicare doctors, the sustainable growth rate, all sorts of issues. I tabulated them all, talked to economists, and said, you know, what might be the cumulative economic effect if all these things are not extended, or half or whatever. So I wrote this, what I thought was a great column, got a lot of feedback on it, and I was content with the lame duck from hell. Two weeks later, the Fed chairman goes before Congress, as asked about these issues, and calls it the fiscal cliff. Do you know how humiliating it is to be a writer and to be out-metaphored and outwritten by the Federal Reserve Chairman? I'm still living that down in Washington these days. Uh, regards the fiscal cliff, I want to tell you a joke that I think uh, it probably was not originally cast as a budget joke, but in my own bizarre way, I think I can lead us all to the punchline there. Uh, it, like many jokes in America, it was originally infused with ethnic characteristics, and America is very sensitive about ethnic humor, so what I will do to make sure there is no wounding or bruising, I'll place all the ethnicities in this joke within my own family, okay? So we'll have a Swede, I'm from Swedes on my mother's side, and an Englishman, my father's roots are English, and then I grew up in San Diego, so the other person in this joke will be a Californian, okay? All right, so the joke goes like this. Three construction workers are on the 80th floor of a project nearing completion, and it's the lunchtime, and they pop open their lunch boxes. And the Swede says, oh my God, in my lunch box again, blood sausage again. I swear if I have blood sausage in this lunch box one more time, I'm going to jump off this building. Englishman opens his lunch box. Shepherd's pie, same thing. If I have shepherd's pie in my lunch box one more time, I'm jumping off this building. Californian opens his lunch box. What does he got? Avocado and bean sprouts. Same thing. Oh, I can't stand it anymore. Avocados and bean sprouts, I'm ending it all. Along comes the next day. In sequence, the Swede opens up his lunchbox. Blood sausage, pew, right off. Englishman opens up his, shepherd's pie, pew, right off. Californian opens his, avocado and bean sprouts, three deaths instantaneously, horrible local tragedy, which is then, of course, obsessively covered by the news. So they interview the wives of the three construction workers. And they're grief-stricken, at least in part. <laughs> the wife of the Swede says, if I'd only known, 
He never said anything to me. My husband was kind of a silent type. If he'd only told me, no blood sausage, I never would have put that in his lunchbox again. A very similar story from the wife of the Englishman. She says, he's kind of more talkative, but he doesn't talk about lunch. We talk about a lot of other things. I wish he'd talked about lunch once, because I never would have put shepherd's pie in there. They go to the wife of the Californian. He said, don't talk to me. He packs his own lunch. <laughs> From a fiscal point of view, we have been packing our own lunch for about 50 years in this country. And we are now going to have to realize that the way we've arranged that lunch has not worked to our long-term advantage economically or fiscally. We have set ourselves up in this own scenario. And now we are on not an 80-floor I-beam with a choice of staying or jumping off, but we're at what Ben Bernanke has memorably called the fiscal cliff. It's a, not a theoretical issue. It's not one of the sort of parlor games that Washington likes to play. It's not who's going to be secretary of this cabinet agency or is the president going to nominate this person for the Supreme Court? Or what are the internecine battles and leadership of the House and Senate? This is a real issue with enormous consequential effect for our economy and, I believe, our national identity. <clears throat> I can't tell you what's going to happen with a fiscal cliff, but I can offer, I think, some road markers to follow in the days ahead. Um, remember, if we go off the cliff, and I know some people don't think of it as a cliff, they think of it as sort of a slope, whatever. If we don't come to agreement on what we're going to do with whatever we are deciding will remain of the Bush tax cuts, of the sequester, the automatic spending cuts affecting defense and non-discretionary, not touching entitlement, a separate issue I'll get to in a minute. But if we don't deal with those and everything attendant around that, economists tell us, the Congressional Budget Office also says, we will go into a recession. Now think about this for a minute. We're not talking about a recession that is brought about by things that simply break down or are misunderstood in our economy. We understand where our economy is now. We'd like to see it grow more, but we understand sort of the fundamentals of what's shaping and misshaping our ability to grow. A lot of it is globalization. A large of it, lot, lot of it is an incapacity of workers to meet those skills that are required in the workforce. And we're trying to figure out ways to get better skilled workers in line more rapidly for those available jobs, et cetera, et cetera. We don't really fundamentally misunderstand What's happening? We are growing gradually and trying to get better. However, if the fiscal cliff is breached or there's any sort of great economic contraction, it will be brought to this country of a forethought by its political class. It will be a premeditated recession foisted on the country by those invested with its political leadership. That seemed to me would be different and different in kind and different in a very bad way because we would not be unified as a country confronting a recession, we would have it foisted upon us as a people by the inactivity, the structured premeditated inactivity of those invested with political leadership from the president throughout Congress. I give speeches with some frequency and I'm frequently asked the question, what major do you believe will break this fever of partisanship and this gridlock? And <clears throat> Tim will, vouch for me on this. I've always been among the more optimistic people covering Capitol Hill. I'm not dismayed by the fact that Congress operates slowly and our political system requires a lot of consensus and it's slow to build. And I'm not, in fact, surprised or necessarily dismayed that there are venal people in politics who make shabby deals and cut deals uh, for themselves and maybe not for the greater glory of the country. Uh, that's the way things, unfortunately, tend to operate. So I've always been on the optimistic or more tolerant side of understanding that there needs to be partisan fights, there need to be disagreements, but then eventually you need to get to consensus. So for a long time I would say, well, they'll figure it out, they'll figure it out. There'll be leadership, there'll be changes of mood, there'll be changes of will. I've given up on all that. I really have. My only answer now is external events. What will change the atmosphere in Washington? External events. What kind of external events? Well, a fiscal cliff is an external event. Now, it's bizarre partially generated by Washington, maybe in, in order to create a sense of public anxiety sufficient enough to knock politicians off their comfortable partisan perches. Let us hope so. But that would be an external event. Everything that's going on with the European economy is an external event. 
The need for this country to confront a wide variety of national security threats, and we see them beginning to spin out of control in the headlines that move hour by hour through our smartphones and droid phones in the Middle East right now, that's a very dangerous neighborhood. What's happening with Gaza and Israel and Egypt and Syria and Turkey and Iran and Iraq, all that stuff is going to come to the fore in rapid succession in the next 13 to 14, 15, 16 months. We're going to be unified to deal with that. That's an external event. Plus, you have bond rating agencies that are also going to say, look, we are, have a limited amount of tolerance to deal with what you're facing and your ability or inability to confront it. So I'm going to fall back on external events changing political decisions and changing political characteristics and what people do with the votes they've been given, either in this lame duck Congress or the newly put together Congress starting in January. But we don't have much time. And I will tell you, if you are at all hopeful about immigration reform, climate change, doing something significant on structural reform of our U.S. tax code, you have to be invested in and curious about what happens on the fiscal cliff. Because if the fiscal cliff becomes unresolvable, then all those other things will be cast in a similarly unresolvable light. I think the president has, I wrote about this last week in the magazine, no more than 20 months. And that's at the absolute end. He might, be, might even have less than that, 16 or 14 months practically, to define his entire second term. Because by then, 14, 16, 18, 20 months, you get the fever of 2014, the midterm elections, 2016 begins to take on more prominence, and his effective ability to galvanize the country and move Congress in any sort of unified direction diminishes. So if you go back from 20 months or 16 or 14 months, I really do think the next 60 to 90 days will be very telling. What the president decides to do, whether the Speaker of the House can unify his caucus in a way that accepts a compromise, whether that compromise can, if not forestall the fiscal cliff, resolve it in a large and comprehensive way, I would say this. The quieter it is in Washington, the more hopeful you should be. There are conversations in the White House now about the President going around and stumping around the country and giving speeches. That very well may be uh, comforting for the President, but I don't think it's reassuring for the public, and I don't think it's reassuring for Republicans. What you need to see, and if you do see it, you should be hopeful. If you don't see it, you should be somewhat discouraged, is quiet. A lot of people that you can't see meeting in places you don't know, even though those in my trade will say, well, it's all behind the scenes, and it's opaque, and no one knows what's going on. It means work's being done. Actual legislative work is being done, and sometimes that needs to be done privately and quietly so it can be done productively. Because what we have seen with these entire range of issues for the last 18 months is plenty of press releases and plenty of speeches. We know the sum total of that work. It's gridlock, partisanship, and inaction. So the quieter it is, I think the better it is. There are many who are already predicting a sort of mini bridge for two or three months. I will tell you that is the path of least resistance, and everything we've learned about Congress and the President in the last 18 months tells us the path of least resistance is the only path they know. But I don't need to tell you that that's not really hopeful. Two or three months of the rep same repetitive uncertainty will not reassure bond markets, it will not reassure your investors, it will not reassure small businesses, and it will continue to paralyze this country with a sense of inactivity. So it may solve a short-term political problem, but the fact remains the hardcore political problems being driven by external events must be confronted. And I would argue the sooner the better. And there are some I've talked to in the Democratic and Republican ranks who see that as sooner the better is the better option for all of the underlying reasons why partisan gridlock has taken on such an enormous focus in American politics. Because Democrats and Republicans primarily are worried about not general elections anymore, but primaries. Well, primaries come sooner, obviously, than general elections. So if you're going to cut a deal now and make a vote that's going to be difficult and make your life politically hazardous, make that vote sooner so you have more time to explain it and more time to show the results. Now, in our casual conversations before I took the podium, many of you told me you thought if there was a deal, there'd be a tremendous enthusiastic reaction across the country, not only about the general tone and temperament of our politics, but that solutions can be reached and that people would have a sense of certainty about the world they're going to live in from a tax perspective, from a spending perspective, and whether or not the good faith and credit of the United States government is going to be reliable for the next two or three years. I agree with you. And I believe that message is slowly seeping in to the upper echelons of the congressional leadership in the White House. We'll see if they have the wherewithal to pull it all together. A couple of brief remarks on the election before I throw it open for questions. There are all sorts of statistics to go through and sift 
in this presidential election. Two really strike me as important. One doesn't have anything to do with the election just passed. In 1988, Michael Dukakis, as the Democratic nominee, lost the white vote in America by 19 percentage points. He won 111 electoral votes. In this election, President Obama lost the white vote by 20%, and he won 332 electoral votes. You can take every other statistic that you can sift through in the exit polling data, demographic alignment in Colorado, Mexico, Nevada, Florida. Just remember that, okay? Those two portraits of America and a presidential electorate in motion tell you how much we've changed in those intervening years. The other statistic that I find most important about what happened in the election just passed is 6%. 6% is the partisan differential in the exit polls, Democrat to Republican. 38% Democrat, 32% Republican. Now, why is this statistic important to me and why do I think it matters? So much of the disbelief that either independents had or some journalists had or Republicans had about the statewide polls up until the election were that they were oversampling Democrats, that they were assuming a higher differential between Republican turnout and Democratic turnout that could possibly happen. Many of those statewide polls had a partisan differential of, depending on the poll, five, six, seven, eight, sometimes nine percent. Republicans said, collectively, that's impossible. That will never be replicated. Why? Because that was what the partisan differential was in 2008, and we will never see that again. That was a fluke. That was an aberration. That was an election full of legitimate, well-meaning enthusiasm for a completely historic moment and turning point for our country. But it's just not going to happen again. Republicans are enthusiastic. They're intense. They want to win. They're going to show up. We'll never have that six-point differential. It's exactly what we saw. Republicans who thought they were enthusiastic or intense either were kidding themselves or were not intense enough, and Democrats who we were told or we theoretically presented with the possibility would be less enthusiastic were just as enthusiastic. Not in numbers. President Obama won with seven and a half million fewer votes than he won with in 2008, the largest contraction of popular vote total in American presidential history, but he still won. But Mitt Romney got fewer votes than John McCain. And what Republicans thought, 2008, was the low watermark for their party, their nominee, and their overall messaging to the country. So that which could not be, was. That seems to me to be instructive for Republicans, for the president, and for anyone who's trying to analyze what actually happened on Tuesday. Republicans didn't show up. Independents who did, who sided with Romney, were insufficient numerically to overcome the strong partisan attachment Democrats had to the president. And they showed up in statistically significant enough numbers across the battle space. Florida, Iowa, Colorado, Nevada, New Hampshire, Virginia, to get the president reelected. One last historical note before I let you go and we open up for questions. This is one fun fact to throw your neighbors and friends who are politically curious. We've had three presidents now in American history who have been re-elected with a lower popular percentage total than they were in their election year. Meaning, when you got re-elected, you had a smaller popular vote percentage than you did when you were elected the first time. President Obama's the third. The one before that, Andrew Jackson. The one before that, James Madison. It's been a while, okay? And this all leads to the question of well, what's the president's mandate? I happen to side with political scientists who say mandates in the second term are earned. They are not conferred. Look, Richard Nixon has the American historical presidential record for largest popular vote increase election to election, 15 million. But we all remember how that turned out. It doesn't necessarily make you a president that's either going to endure or that's going to be actually that productive. So you do with it what you can do with it. And my last point on that is President Obama now knows something he didn't know before he won. That he could win, he could win on his terms, and he could win with his message. First, Democrats seeking re-election in our country to run on a platform, an explicit platform of raising taxes to prevail. Republicans have to internalize that message. The argument was there, visible, and adjudicated. Mitch McConnell 
told me and I told the world in October of 2010 that his number one priority was to make sure that Barack Obama was a one-term president. He has failed. Republicans simply must internalize the fact that the president's re-election in 2012 and his election in 2008 were not flukes. Similarly, the president must also comp comprehend and deal with the fact that he has a House Republican majority returned to power. They are not a fluke either. 2010 wasn't an aberration either. It was real. It was communicating something about divided powers and pulling the country in a different direction together. It will be up to the speaker and the president to internalize those messages, deal with these external events, and find a different way of not only communicating to their own parties, but to the country and solving problems. Because if they don't, they will reap the ruin. We will first, but then we'll all come back on them. And with that, we'll throw it up into questions. You've been a great audience. Thank you. Thank you, Major. By the way, is the microphone working well for everyone on the extremes of the room? Can you hear? Uh, and I'm going to open this up to questions from the audience, um, but I'm going to wait until the microphone is actually in your hand and we've got the, um, the volume set properly. And in order to allow for that, so get your, get your questions ready. Uh, I'm going to ask a question that was submitted to us uh, ahead of time. Uh, and it's a little bit off topic in terms of the fiscal cliff and the economic consequences as well as a little bit off topic in terms of the, uh, the outcome of the election and what message we take from it. But because it quotes um, uh, someone who I greatly admire, former New York Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, with whom I served on the President's Social Security Commission, I'm going to use the question just to get things rolling. Uh, and thank you for allowing so much time for Q&A because I know a lot of folks will have questions. Uh, Moynihan once observed, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. So much reporting on important issues seems to be a he said, she said, giving equal weight to both sides, and both sides can't really be correct. This kind of coverage doesn't serve the public well. This is the opinion of the questioner. What do you see as the role of the press in fact-checking and parsing claims from both sides? Well, fact-checking took on tremendous prominence in this uh, election campaign. Uh, it became a kind of cottage industry within journalism and something that campaigns used um, as a mechanism by which to either verify what they were saying or discredit what the rival campaign was saying. And <clears throat> then after a while, there became a kind of um, filtering debate over, well, what is a fact? And why is it relevant? And why does this set of facts get accumulated in response to whatever this particular politician says? Tim knows, as well as anyone who covers any legislative debate, you can array any set of facts to buttress your own argument once you've decided what you're going to argue. You can pull together whatever facts you want. When I was at the University of Missouri School of Journalism, uh, I had a beloved professor, Hal Lister, who was really essential to my whatever journalistic skills I possess. And he had a phrase that I've always tried to remember. He would say, that's not just a fact, that's a true fact. <laughs> and my beloved Hal Lister, I think, is at the epicenter of the underlying tone of this question. What is a true fact, and what is my obligation to try to get as irreducibly close to that as I possibly can as a journalist? Now, look, I've done a lot of different types of journalism. I've written books, as Tim said, was kind enough to mention. I worked at magazines, news magazines, which work on a weekly schedule. I worked at newspapers. I spent 10 years in cable television. Um, and now I've returned to a, a, a news magazine that, unlike Time or Newsweek, uh, or my former publication, US News and World Report, will allow me to write a 5,700 word article about some enormous issue in Congress so I can really sort of breathe a little with the facts and analysis and everything else. So I've been in, in a lot of different variations of journalism, and I've always tried to do the thing that most represents what this questioner is about, separating not just stated facts or contended points of view, but where possible, place them in relationship to what's actually happened. Now, uh, that's not as easy as it might sound, because you can say something about the trade deficit, for example, and say it's terrible. And there are economists who will agree that the trade deficit, for example, is terrible.
But you can also find economists who will say, well, no, not necessarily, only if you look at this part of it, because the trade deficit can be helpful because it means more goods and services come to the United States at lower prices, which helps people who need to have things that are less expensive. Well, so who's, who's right there? Well, if you've lost a job doing to, do, due to trade, you think the person who thinks the trade deficit is a problem and trade dumping is an issue is right. And if you're a consumer who doesn't live or know anyone who's lost a job but is benefiting from uh, polo shirts or something else that you can purchase at half the price that you could when your mother bought them 30 years ago, you might think the trade is okay. So who's right? Who's correct? What's the true fact there? And you can do that across the entire range of issues in our country. So it's always, and this will sound like a bit of a cop-out, my endeavor has always been, and I would invite anyone who's ever watched me or read me, to be A, accountable. If I screwed up, I admit it. And I guarantee you, I've gone to my editors a hell of a lot earlier than they've ever come to me to correct something I've screwed up, because it's my responsibility to be accountable to my audience. Number two, learn and be curious on a continuous basis. Because if you're not learning and, be, and continuously curious, fact patterns change, and something that was a true fact Wednesday might not be a true fact on Friday. You've got to keep revisiting all the data. That's what I do. And I, at times like this, never try to speak for the entire media colossus because my standards are mine and to the degree that they are um, either laudable or people look at how I've succeeded, perhaps they set a tone, uh, but that's how I've always approached it. And I'm not asking this question to embarrass you, but uh, six months ago you did predict and it's printed here, I think that was your final line, uh, Rob Portman would be the running mate for Romney. Yeah. Um, so uh, just talk a little bit about that uh, prediction, which you screwed up, <laughs> and, uh, and, and maybe the implications of uh, that decision on Romney's part. Uh, that reminds me of a scene from All the President's Men. Do you remember this? If, if, you've, if you're familiar with the movie, uh, I, for some reason, am very familiar with that movie. I can't imagine why. Um, there's a great scene in the movie where Ben Bradley is explaining to Woodward and Bernstein that when he was a reporter, he got the word that Johnson was going to fire uh, J. Edgar Hoover. And he wrote a story. And J. Edgar Hoover put the thumb on Lyndon Johnson. The next day, Lyndon Johnson appointed him FBI director for life. And so one of the administration officials who worked for Lyndon Johnson said to Ben Bradley, well, Ben, you screwed up. You stuck us with Hoover for life. And Ben Bradley in the movie says, I screwed up, but I wasn't wrong. On the Portman prediction, I screwed up, but I wasn't wrong. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, we've got microphones. We've got microphones in the audience, so uh, please uh, speak clearly and identify yourself. Uh, I'm Ron Schutz. Uh, Major, thank you very much. I'd like your thoughts on a couple of additional facts. And I'm right here. Yeah. And, and those facts are that we have $16 trillion in debt mm -hmm. that is being serviced at historically low interest rates, yep. that the debt is going to continue to increase no matter what they do in Washington, even if they make some attempt to fix the fiscal cliff. And as that debt increases and interest rates inevitably start to rise and rolling it over becomes more expensive, is there any recognition in Washington that that is simply not sustainable? I think there is a, an arithmetic and academic recognition of it, but there is yet to be a political recognition of it, okay? Um, and you can talk to economists right now who will say, you know, for our own country's infrastructure needs, which are pronounced, this, is, this might be, even though that is a, a large number, 16 trillion, it feels vaguely terrifying, or maybe actually terrifying to many people who look at it. Now it might be in the short term, for the next two or three years, a time to increase debt in pursuit of dramatically stepped up in infrastructure investments because the servicing of that debt is lower than it's likely to be for a good long while. And that money's cheap, and if it's invested in the country and put behind things that actually materially affect commerce, transit, jobs, and all the things that grow out of infrastructure, now might be the time to do that. No, I, I, the, 
the stimulus, since you asked, was about $230 billion of tax cuts that were uh, basically cash on a weekly basis that went nowhere or were saved or bought, bought down internal, deleveraged personal debt. And then a lot of other projects that were not shovel ready. I heard the phrase. Uh, I'm just saying that there are economists who look at something that would be structured differently than the stimulus and devoted entirely to infrastructure because the debt load, though high, would be easier and le less expensive to service now than ever before. That's a, that's a practical arithmetic fact, just as, as that it's large is an arithmetic fact. Congress isn't going to do that because of what you just said. No one wants or is interested in the politics of another stimulus, no matter how it's adorned or described. So the debt is secondary in the consciousness of Congress right now to the sequester. And the real access point is going to be how much the Republicans give on taxes and how much the president give on defense spending. But then you have one enormous wild card. And I would say, in all due respect to uh, the two senators from this great state, Amy Klobuchar, Al Franken, and other newly arrived Democratic senators, and those who were already there, like Bernie Sanders, Sheldon Whitehouse, and others, not to mention their uh, Democratic counterparts in the House, if they look at any emerging deal and say, wait a minute, let me get this straight. We're going to let the Bush tax cuts for the wealthy expire. And in, res and in return for that concession from Republicans, we're going to soften defense cuts but we're gonna keep the domestic discretionary cuts, I'm raising taxes on the wealthy to give it to the Pentagon. I would, I would present to you the very likely scenario they would find that disagreeable in the extreme. And they would say, look, I'm not gonna do, I'm not voting for that. We need, something, we need to do something else. Similarly, there is a faction of conservatives in the House who say, hey, wait a minute, let the defense cuts ride for a couple of years, they can economize. Because if we don't do the defense cuts, we're going to have to give ground on the domestic discretionary cuts because senators like the two from here and other states are going to demand it. So there are all sorts of cross points on this, all under the rubric of the debt's too large, our $1 trillion deficits annualized for four years now are unsustainable, and we have to get our arms around this. That's a true fact up here, okay, both as a, as, as a, as a concept and as arithmetic. What has yet to happen is that has yet to translate and trickle down in any perceptible willingness to make a political compromise that's durable. There's an old saying in the House, Tim heard it, if you don't have the votes, you don't have S, and S doesn't rhyme with shoot, okay? You need the votes. Whatever you decide to do has to have the votes to pass. Without the votes, it's just a notion, and we're far past the time where we can operate in the politics of notions. All right, are there questions on this side of the room? Who's, which microphone is closest here? Okay, we'll give you just a second. Speak clearly, identify who you are. Hi, Greg Peterson. Uh, you know, one of the two Republicans on the national ticket, Paul Ryan, won uh, an election uh, to return to the House. Uh, how did his uh, participation on the top ticket maybe affect his uh, uh, influence? in the House caucus, and where does his budget thinking land after uh, his role as a vice presidential candidate? Well, uh, that will obviously be sorted out if he decides to run in 2016. He's well positioned. He's certainly well known, tremendous name recognition. Um, regarded, I think, by most Republicans and the Romney campaign as a net positive. But to my earlier point, I, was, I screwed up on Rob Portman, but I wasn't wrong. I guarantee you Mitt Romney would have been better positioned to have Rob Portman on the ticket than Paul Ryan. And look at the closing argument that Governor Romney made, the one that was most resonant and the one that helped him bring him closer in a lot of the swing states. It was a bipartisan message of meeting with Democrats, coming up with common sense solutions. That's all Rob Portman's bailiwick. That's his whole history in Congress. And that was not, whether that is agreeable or disagreeable, Paul Ryan's reputation in the House. Paul Ryan is an intellectual force of conservatism in the House Republican Conference, proudly so, and demonstrably so, with his own budget and his own ideas. So that's why you saw less and less of Paul Ryan down the home stretch. And I think if Rob Portman would have been on the ticket, not only would have Ohio been closer and more competitive from the get-go, it would have been more consistent with the overall closing message that Romney had and that was working for him better than anything else he had tried beforehand. Now, we have a practical demonstration just two days ago in Washington 
of Paul Ryan's influence, as you asked, about it within the House Republican Conference. There was a leadership race, only one contested leadership race in the House Republican Conference. Tom Price was running for conference chair, conservative, and he was opposed by Kathy McMorris Rogers, also a conservative, relatively newcomer, woman from Washington, mother of two, terrific, they're both terrific Republicans, stalwart ideas, driven people. Ryan supported Price, the speaker supported Kathy McMorris Rogers. Kathy McMorris Rogers won. Paul Ryan's first intramural battle post-election within his conference, he lost. That doesn't mean it's over, doesn't mean he's diminished, doesn't mean he's a, 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 a shadow of his former self, it just means things are changing. Image, projection of image matters, and enough Republicans decided Kathy McMorris Rogers, backed by the speaker, was a better option than Tom Price, backed by Paul Ryan. So. That's one thing to take note of. Other questions? Uh, if not, and I, I know that we're running up on the end of the hour, and we always try to get you out here uh, very close to the 1 o'clock hour. I do have one last question, because immigration uh, kind of played out in a variety of uh, ways during this uh, cycle, starting with the primaries and concluding in the fall, where it was uh, it was postulated that one of the factors in the large Hispanic vote for Obama, larger than four years ago, was the immigration issue. Um, you've recently written about this issue. Is there a way to find um, bipartisan common ground on this issue? Set aside which party will get the credit for that. Is, is there a way to uh, get past the division? Well, there might be a way. and. Um there are a good number of Republicans uh, who are looking at the um, results of the exit poll data and concluding that immigration is an impediment to having a broader conversation with a large and ever larger growing uh, demographic group in our country that they believe that they can win over. But the reason they can't win over them is because immigration becomes a kind of bit of, and I wrote this in my column this week, white noise very white noise, to Hispanics about everything else. It feels exclusionary. I had an interview with Marco Rubio, senator from Florida, two days ago, and he said it's very hard to talk to any group about economics, about education, about justice, law enforcement, border control, national defense, foreign policy, when they think you want to deport their grandmother. And I, I mean, I think that's pretty clear. If, if you think, the, wait a minute, so you're talking about education, but you still want to deport my grandmother, right? That's a barrier uh, that creates a distance, and Republicans are beginning to understand that. And I wrote in my column, look, uh, there are those Republicans who say, we'll just roll over on immigration and that will solve everything. I don't think that's true. First of all, you can't be a party that for 10 years stands on the basis of what part of illegal or breaking the law, don't you understand, meaning amnesty can't be done because this is a crime and the crime must be punished, adjudicated, and you have to leave the country or do something nearly as severe as leaving the country before you can become a legalized resident, not even a citizen, just someone who can live here and work here legally. That's 10 years of rhetoric, and you have vote after vote after vote accumulated over many elections that followed that rhetoric. And so just think about this tactically. If you roll over on that, do you suddenly believe all the Hispanics who thought you wanted to deport their grandmother are going to rush into your waiting arms and your base is just going to be fully content with that? No. So you have to come up with a different solution. You have to talk about the legal process of transferring 10, 11, 12, 14, whatever the number is, we don't actually know the number of undocumented workers living in our country to a legal status and possibly citizenship. And I've come up with an idea that I will just tell you, since I wrote the column, has uh, received some positive feedback from Democrats, Republicans, and uh, some mayors across the country. And the idea is this, very simply. We have AmeriCorps. AmeriCorps is a community and national service bureaucracy run of the federal government. Every governor in all 50 states uses it, understands it, has a bureaucracy in their state to match volunteers who get a stipend for doing community service. Okay. Republicans have never been a big fan of this program, but they've come around. Mitt Romney supported it, Rick Santorum supported it, Newt Gingrich, after trying to kill it, has now come around on it. I will tell you, just as an anecdotal uh, bit of evidence, 
The New York Times had a great story. Right after Hurricane Sandy hit, uh, 20 national conservation corps, what they're called, volunteers with AmeriCorps, flew from Montana, your home state here in Minnesota, and the state of Washington to New York. They brought all their big saws. They thought they'd be removing debris from the beaches. They were sent to Rockaway and said, put down your saws. We need you to run an emergency shelter for elderly people who have mobility and memory issues, and it's in the seventh floor of a technical high school. And that's what your job is. And they've done it for a month, and they're still doing it now. No experience, no background, but they're doing it. They're taking people who have, and my mother's 82, and she has mobility and memory issues. I know from what they're dealing with. And they're doing it. And these are AmeriCorps volunteers. These people know what they're doing. They're totally devoted to community service. So here's my idea. Take the AmeriCorps bureaucracy and match it with undocumented workers who want to accelerate their process through legalization by performing verifiable community service. They don't get paid, no stipend, but you get in line, and the more you work, the more you do, the more you mentor, paint, clear garbage, clean rivers, whatever the task is, the more hours you log, the more visibly you do it, the faster you move through the legalization and ultimately citizenship process. And the first thing you get in America as you do this is you get your AmeriCorps, I would call it Citizen Corps, identification card. It doesn't provide anything other than you're in the system. You know who you are and you're going to volunteer. It's not punitive. It's not punishment. It's your means by dem to demonstrate that you want to get into the community, do things for the community, enhance it, and accelerate your process through the legalization system. That seems to me to be something we have a bureaucracy for now. We don't need the immigration courts to adjudicate it. And it takes away the stigma of community service as punishment. And it also takes away the thing that many Republicans are most uncomfortable about, leveling a fine to become an American. Americans believe our country is priceless. And we're not comfortable assigning a dollar value becoming a citizen or a legal resident. Guess what? Under Citizens Corps, you don't have to. Work, 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 move yourself through the process. The community sees you, you see the community. I think it's an idea worth thinking about. And I can tell you, since Wednesday, some people are. So I'm hopeful about that. Thank you, Mayor. Stay here. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> Major, we thank you for your insights. And uh, I'm presenting you now with our Economic Club paperweight. This might be easier to get through security than those economic club beverages we provided you with last night. Um, we, we gave him some Minnesota products, including some liquids, which he probably can't take on the plane. Major, thank you so much for being with us. And I thank you in advance for tonight. Uh, there's a Penny Fellowship Scholarship uh, dinner tonight um, uh, hosted by the State University Student Association. And uh, because Major was... Uh, not only a dear friend of mine, uh, but a dear friend of my first wife, Barb, uh, prior to her passing. Uh, and he knows of our commitment to uh, community service, which you just spoke about eloquently, uh, and internships at the state and federal capital. He is here uh, in addition to this presentation to talk to our audience tonight. So thank you for that. The Economic Club of Minnesota's mission is to provide a world-class nonpartisan forum for national and international leaders in business and public policy to discuss ideas that affect how Minnesota can better compete in the global economy. The Economic Club of Minnesota, engaging the world, strengthening Minnesota. <laughs>